right? And uh, that's, you know, Zoom's extra warnings. It lets you know if uh, the meeting is being live streamed and lets you know if you're being recorded. So, um, <clears throat> so it's, it's uh, great to see everyone on a Wednesday that's not a holiday, uh, though it is Rosh Chodesh. Uh, the new month of, uh, it's the 30th of Tishrei, which is, which is uh, Rosh Chodesh. And um, let me just mute all. Um, and um, so the, the portion this week is uh, Noah. And what I wanted uh, to focus on uh, first this morning is the end of the portion, uh, the beginning of the seventh Aliyah. So we're in the portion Noah chapter 11 of Genesis, um, and it's <clears throat> uh, page 58, page 58 in the Eitz Chaim, but look for the seventh Aliyah of the portion Noah, which is the start of chapter 11. So that's, that's where we're at. So what we're going to do is look at these, uh, sh the short story that's presented here, nine sentences about the Tower of Babel. And um, the flood story, which most of the portion of Noah is about, we're very familiar with. And um, I don't, I thought the Tower of Babel story we're familiar with, but maybe not as familiar as the flood story. So that would be, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to focus on this. So um, the blessing for Torah study, Baruch HaTadunai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Sher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah, V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So here we are, chapter 11. Vayehi Chol Ha'aretz, just in context, there's a genealogy that we're presented with in chapter 10, who are the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Yafet, the three sons of Noah and his wife, um, and their progeny uh, through multiple generations, okay? And then um, we get to uh, chapter 11, okay? So verse 32 says, these are the groupings of Noah's descendants according to their origins by their nations, and from these the nations branched out over the earth after the flood, okay? So everyone... Um, spread out after the flood. Now, chapter 11. Vayehi chol ha'aretz safa echat udivarim achadim. So that's translated as everyone on earth, on earth had the same language. That makes sense. One language. Literally, it would be all the earth was one language. Udivarim achadim. Now this can be, I'm not even looking at the translation yet. The translation could be Udivarim. They were one, there was one language over all the earth and Divarim achadim. Could be and few words. One language and few words. That's in modern Hebrew, Divarim achadim would mean few words. Now, the English translation here says, and the same words. Safaria, which has the older English translation, the 1917 uh, JPS translation, has everyone on earth had the same language and the same words. So that I don't get. That from that, if, from the words Devarim Achadim. I don't understand how that can be translated as the same words. I, I can understand the few, uh, few words, but I just don't get same words. Okay. So now um, I, uh, so, hmm. okay. So I, I just raise that as a question. What I want to do is read all nine sentences and then go one verse at a time to see uh, to kind of unpack the story, okay? And uh, we're going to unpack it with Rashi's help and also with the commentary that's on the page here in Eitz Chaim. So already question number one is about the Hebrew, Udivarim Achadim, what that means, what's translated as same words. Verse two, 
ויהי בנוסעם מקדם, וימצאו ויקעה בארץ שנער, וישבו שם. And it came to pass when they traveled from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. Who? Who did? Who's the they in this verse? Who are the people who went to the valley in the land of Shinar and settled there? Are they just from verse 32 of chapter 10? We don't know. So that's another question. Who are these people referred to here anonymously as settling in this valley? Verse 3. Vayomru ish el re'ehu, hava nilbina levenim, v'nisrefa lesrefa, v'tehi lahem halevena la'even, v'hachemar hayalahem Chomer. They said one to the other, let us make bricks and burn them hard. Okay, I'll go with that English translation. And the brick served them as stone and bitumen or pitch uh, served them as mortar. Okay, so this parenthetical note why they're using bricks and what, what they're using as mortar. Vayomru, and they said, Hava nivne lanu ir, let's build us a city. Umigdal virosho beshamayim, and a tower with its head in the sky. Vinaase lanu shame, it will make for ourselves a name. Pen nafuts al adama. Else we shall be scattered all over the world. Okay, so build a city and a tower to, uh, to make sure that they stay uh, close together instead of being scattered. Okay, verse 5. Vayered Adonai, lir ot et ha'ir ve et hamigdal, God came down to see the city and the tower, Asher Banu B'nei Ha'adam, that the sons of the man built. Okay, now, uh, the English translation says that and, uh, that man had built. Literally, um, so I'm doing the literal translation, that the sons of the man built. Vayomru, Vayomer Adonai, Hein Am Echad, Vesafa Achat Lechulam, Veze Hachilam Laasot. And God said, Huh, there is one people and one language for everyone. And this is how they have begun to act, or this is what they have begun to do. Vaata lo yibatser mehem. And now uh, nothing will be out of reach. Kol asher yazmu laasot. Anything that they initiate, they can do. Okay, so God says this is what they're doing. Nothing will be out of reach for them. Anything that they plan to do they'll be able to do. Seven, Hava nerda v'navla sham sifatam. Let us, now presumably this is God talking, let us go down and confound their, their language. Asher lo yishmu ish sifat ehu, so that, um, um, just one second. I just have to. Um, the, uh, so uh, let us go down. Let us confound their language so that they cannot hear, so that a person cannot hear 
the language of their fellow. Okay, so the here could be translated as understood, or the here, H-E-A-R, can, can be understood as understood. So that uh, I'll confound their language so that one person cannot understand what the other person is saying. Eight, Vayafetz Adonai Otam Misham Al Penei Kol Haaretz Vayachdilu Livnot Ha'ir. God then dispersed them over all the earth and they stopped building the city. Alkain Karashima Bavel, therefore, its name was called Bavel, right from the verse seven, Navla, the, uh, to confound, Bet Lamed Hey, here Bavel, Bet Bet Lamed. So two of the letters are the same. So therefore, the, it was called Bavel because there, Kisham Balal Adonai Safat Kol Haaretz, because there God confounded the language of all the earth, umisham hefitsam Adonai, and from there God spread them, al penei kol haaretz, on the face of the earth. Okay, this is the story. And then it goes on to, to, to provide us with the genealogy of the son Shem. So we have Ham and Yafet in chapter 10 genealogy. Uh, we have the Tower of Babel story, and now the genealogy of the son Shem. Okay, so this Tower of Babel story, nine sentences, comes to um, it, 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 it comes as a just as a an aside in in this story in, in the genealogy. Okay, so before we get to a one verse at a time, what kind of impression do you have of this story? Um, what did the people do to merit God having to come down and to confound their language? Is what they did so bad? And any other questions you have about the story before, we, before I look to Rashi? Anybody have any comments? So, no, okay, that's fine. fair enough because I, I looked at it at a few times myself. And uh, let's, just, let's just go through this with Rashi to see what Rashi would do. Now, we, what, what are the, the, the lessons that we have about the Tower of Babel story are that the, the people in, in that city were trying to be godlike, building a tower to the heavens in order to be like God. But the verse doesn't say anything about that because they just want to make a name for themselves. That's all that verse 4 says. They say nothing about wanting to approach God. But one of the, one of the lessons of the Tower of Babel story is that it's possible that, um, that they are trying to be godlike. So that's one thing uh, that I just want to, uh, to point out, that there are certain impressions that we have here that they've done, they're doing something incredibly wrong, where really by looking at the verse, the story is just trying to come to explain how people got dispersed over the land and how cities came to be. And this is just one of several origin stories that we have in the first 11 chapters of, of Genesis. Like, why do women have pain in childbirth? Why do men have to work hard for a living? Um, so that's all part of the Garden of Eden story. Um, where did all people come from? Where do animals come from? Where did, uh, where did the, the universe come from? Um, so, um, yeah, and, and maybe, maybe the tower, Dennis is suggesting in the chat that maybe the tower could have been um, used for idol worship again. Uh, lessons to be learned by the rabbis, but nothing in this uh, in this story has anything about idol worship. There is no idol worship in this story. So the origins, and also the origin story, maybe this is the origin story of, of Babylonia, 
because later in the in the Bible, Babylonia is the nation that uh, that uh, that destroys the first temple in Jerusalem. So who are these Babylonians? Well, look at these Babylonians. They were trying to make a name for themselves, and God confounded their language. So that's who this Babylonian people are. So maybe it's to maybe the story is written closer to the time of the, of the destruction of the temple in order to provide some kind of comfort to the people of Israel at the time. These Babylonians were a tool of God at, at that time. And so we're going to be saved again, uh, possibly from these Babylonians by God. So there's a whole, there's a, a bunch of layers to the story that uh, perhaps uh, uh, are based on nothing from the story itself. So let's, Rashi is a good place to turn in order to, because Rashi provides for us um, information from rabbinic literature. So going through the, the story phrase by phrase, what is the uh, everyone on earth had the same language. And Rashi says, what is that? So he asks, what, what is that language? And he says, it's Hebrew. So that, that we don't know. And that's from the Midrash. So the original language that everybody's speaking is Hebrew. So that's a nice Midrash, right? So we know that Hebrew is an ancient language, but is Hebrew the oldest language? It's not. Uh, it's a language that developed from earlier Semitic languages. There's, there are languages that are extinct, like Ugaritic and Phoenician and um, Sumerian that uh, all lend themselves to, um, as precursors to Hebrew. So we know that there are languages that are older than Hebrew, but for the rabbis, what that it makes sense to them that the oldest language would be Hebrew. So now, what is this phrase, devarim achadim, which is translated here as same words, or as I translate it as few words? So how can we understand? It's, it's an awkward phrase, and it's an unusual phrase. So Rashi offers a, a, a few explanations. So because uh, here, uh, uh, the same language and the same speech is the um, older translation. Um, where it says, uh, they came with one plan, saying he has no right to select the heavenly regions exclusively for himself. Let us ascend to the skies and make war upon him. So, in other words, Rashi from the Midrash is suggesting they had one language and few words. What are those few words? The few words are, this is the plan that we're going to have we're going to build this tower to reach heaven. That's the few words that Rashi says um, the, these people have. Or another explanation uh, that they are words regarding the soul being in the universe. In other words, they're talking about echad, devarim achadim, they're words about echad words about the one God. Or another explanation is they spoke devarim chadim. They, they spoke sharp words. Just drop the aleph, which is a silent letter, and you get the word chad, which means sharp. So they spoke sharp words. What are they? They said once in every 1,656 years, which according to the rabbis was the creation of the universe was year zero and the flood happened in uh, the year 1,656. There is a heaven shaking just as there was in the days of the flood. Come then and let us make supports for it. In other words, we build this tower in order to be a pillar to support the heaven so that it doesn't come down on earth again. So that's an interesting midrash that the heavens opened up and collapsed in the time of the flood. Let's build a tower 
so that will support the heaven so that it won't collapse again. Okay, so these, these comments by Rashi, which he's quoting Midrash, kind of provide a context for us as to why uh, that what happens in the story happens in the story. And that uh, some of it is uh, legitimate, possibly. It's an interesting idea that the people wanted to build a tower in order to uh, support the heavens, right? And their primitive notions that the heavens were falling, it's like Chicken Little saying that the sky is falling, the sky is falling. So to prevent the sky from falling, you build a tower to, uh, like as a support beam. So uh, it's, a legit, it's a creative uh, uh, idea and why not? So um, I, I, that's a fascinating take on why they're building the tower. And there's nothing really here uh, except for this one idea. What is their few word? What are the few words? The few words are trying to develop a plan for uh, building this tower. So, um, okay. Uh, I wanted also to look at uh, the, the comment on verse three um that who are these uh, uh okay just a second uh right so uh just one second there is a i'm just looking ahead okay in verse five in verse five, why is God coming down? And what do we learn from God coming down? So Rashi says, the Lord came down to see. God really did not need to do this, but scripture, Torah, intends to teach the, the ju judges uh, in the future that they should not proclaim a defendant guilty before they have seen the case and thoroughly understand the matter in question. This is to, to be found in Midrash. Right. So in other words, God coming down to check out what's going on here in the in the city of Bavel is serves as halachic proof for why judges need to investigate before they reach a ruling. So from this completely legendary folk story, the rabbis are also learning some law and procedure that this is what we're, what judges are supposed to do when they begin to handle a case, okay? And then it says, why, why are the people referred to as B'nai Ha'adam, the children of the man, right? So that's also an awkward phrasing here because the English doesn't make it awkward. It just says, uh, uh, to, the Lord came down to look at the city and tower that man had built, kind of um, gla glancing over the unusual Hebrew here, which has the, the letter He. So it's not man, but it's the man. So it's uh, Rashi says the children of the man. So he says that it is Adam. But whose children could they have been except the children of Adam? Right? We're not talking, uh, perhaps the children of donkeys or camels, uh, but it means, right, so he's saying that in kind of a uh, facetious, sarcastic kind of way. Of course, they're going to be people that we're talking about, but why? Why does it say the man? But it means the children of Adam, the first man, who proved himself ungrateful when he said in chapter three, the woman whom you gave to me uh, she gave me the, tr the fruit of the tree. So these people also were ungrateful, rebelling against God who had showered kindness upon them and had rescued them from the flood. So why are they referred to as the children of the man, meaning the children of Adam? Because just like Adam had this particular personality trait of being ungrateful to God 
for having created woman because woman gave him the fruit to eat. Um, so too, these people are ungrateful too. Like, uh, and the rabbis understanding their uh, being ungrateful uh, through the act of building this tower. Why do you need the tower to reach heaven? Just be grateful to God that you're alive and that you're uh, and that you are here to populate the earth after uh, after the flood. So that's an interesting take too. Um, and uh, just a second. Uh, Uh, there's just something. I'm... Okay, so God, the punishment for the that God uh, imposes upon the people is to scatter them over the earth. So if the rabbis think that building the tower was so bad that the the um, they had to be scattered over the earth, they ask this following question. Uh, Rashi says this. This teaches that they have no portion in the world to come. That is, that for being scattered over the earth teaches the rabbis that they have no portion in the world to come. Which sin was greater, that of the generation of the flood or that of the generation of the dispersion? That's what this is, the dispersion after building the tower. The former, the generation of the flood, did not stretch forth their hands against God. The latter did stretch forth their hands against God to war against God. Surely then the sin of the generation of the dispersion was greater. And yet the former, the generation of, of, of the flood, were drowned, and these did not perish from the world. So in other words, the, this generation of building the tower was, it was seen by the rabbis an attack against God. The generation of the flood, they weren't attacking God. They were just immoral. So why were the immoral people destined to die by a flood where the people attacking God only were dispersed over the face of the earth? But the reason is, Rashi says, that the generation of the flood were violent robbers and there was strife among them and therefore they were destroyed. But these conducted themselves in love and friendship. As it is said, they were one people and had one language. You may learn from this how hateful to God is strife and how great is peace. So even though the rabbis are su suggesting the people were idolatrous by building this tower to reach God, uh, they were still peaceful people. And God prefers peace even if, even among idolaters, than God uh, uh, over violent robbers. So I wanted to spend time uh, on this section and uh, just to, to have us understand the rabbinic uh, understanding of this story, to put it in that context, because the story itself, as we saw, is kind of sparse in its details. And so how do the rabbis fill in the gaps and what are the interesting lessons that we're learning? So um, a fascinating lesson about why the flood came and why God didn't destroy this generation with a flood. Another fascinating idea as well as to why the people are building this tower different from what's presented in the Torah too. So now, if we let's, let's just look below the line now in the Eitz Chaim on page 58. Commanded to disperse and settle the earth, Noah's descendants insist on clustering in one area. Commanded to submit to the will of God, they set out to make a name for themselves. Uh, the story of the Tower of ba Babel seems inspired by the Babylonian temple towers known as ziggurats. And these ziggurats, we have them, archaeological discoveries, are similar to the Mayan pyramids that are found throughout Mexico and Central America. It's that kind of shape and size that the purpose of the ziggurat in ancient Babylonia is to try to uh, reach the heavens. So um, the Eitz Chaim goes on. Can we sense here the Torah's ambivalence about large cities with the anonymity, crime, and lack of neighborliness they represent? 
or its suspicion that technology, the celebration of human ingenuity, will often lead to idolatry, people worshiping the work of their own hands. So that's another lesson as well, right? People coming together, using their own uh, labors and their own knowledge to do things that might lead them to be arrogant and thinking how great they are. And that, this is a question that um, philosophers of society ask all the time, like, and it could be asked about Facebook at this very moment with the person who, um, from Facebook, who um, testified before Congress yesterday, right? What, what are the effects on society of social media? What is it doing to us? What is it doing to our brains? What is it doing to our children? What, um, what, what are we supposed to do about this? So, so Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all of the, and TikTok and all these other social media, social media platforms are platforms and uh, focusing on human beings and not really focusing and, and creating such, um, such an atmosphere that, um, uh, just a second, uh, it's creating such an atmosphere that uh, people think, uh, 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 cre creating certain imagery, like this is the kind, kind of person that we're trying to be, uh, and anybody else who's not like this um, should be uh, uh, not included, peer pressure, bullying, all this stuff that happens on social media. Uh, but, um, but people ask these questions uh, when the telephone was invented, when electricity was uh, invented, any new technology that transforms society. People ask the question, is this good uh, for the future of society or not? And that's, that's possibly a question that the Torah is approaching here by sharing this story of the Tower of Babel. Maybe it's an anti-urban sentiment that the story is trying to present uh, uh, and a pro-agricultural nomadic kind of attitude. It's possible. That's what its time is suggesting. Uh, it continues. One writer distinguishes between mountain cultures which see the heart of the world in wilderness, revering nature and adapting to it, and tower cultures for whom the essence of the world is the city and the human-made environment, stripping the sense of awe from nature and attaching it to the social and technological order, right? Um, Egypt, land of pyramids and treasure cities will be a tower culture. Israel from Mount Sinai to the Temple Mount will be largely a mountain culture. The people of the Tower of Babel are a preeminent example of a tower culture. Although human beings have done many wonderful things to reshape their environment, there's always the danger, 59, of becoming so enamored of technology that human values are lost. Our rabbinic legend relates that people paid no mind if a worker on the tower fell to his death. If a brick fell, however, they lamented the delay in their building project. The purpose of these awe-inspiring monuments erected by the technical skill of men was to enable people to forget their insignificance and transient nature. Right. So these fascinating philosophical ideas about what the Tower of Babel represents and that um, what, what are the long-term impacts on our society and what, what should be the values that we should be representing. Okay, so this is what I wanted to share from the portion Noah uh, today. Uh, any, any other, any questions or comments you have? Because otherwise we'll end here early today because there are just other things that have just been happening here in the office that I have to attend to. Uh, any other uh, questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, some. I, I, I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed at the imagination involved. Yes. In, in these sections, yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I have no, no, it's okay. Uh, the imagination is is really fascinating, and yeah. um, the the creative creative mind of the uh, rabbis is really really 
uh, immense. And, um, you know, just, just, to, uh, just to, to use word associations, you know, it, it's, it's not unlike people who are uh, literary scholars, like a, a Shakespeare scholar or a Homer scholar, you know, someone who would take each and every word and kind of compare it to other words that appear uh, elsewhere in Shakespeare or Homer, or uh, no, uh, like, I don't know, uh, like my kids were into Harry Potter books when they came out. So allusions in book seven to book one and vice versa uh, are fascinating. Uh, people like to, to make those allusions. So the Bible, which uh, could be argued a more important religious lessons to be gained and, you know, uh, guidelines for how we're supposed to lead our lives uh, to then uh, get those lessons from word associations found in the Torah itself. It's just fascinating stuff that the rabbis do. And so there's no end to their creativity. And yeah. when, when they make this association, they think that it's it's meant to be found. The, the, the Torah is written in its unusual way in order for us to derive these lessons. Yes, Summer. So that's uh, it's just uh, fascinating the the work of uh, the rabbis in in midrash. So, and we'll we'll see more of it as as we continue to study the uh, the Torah portion of the week. So, uh, I I hope everybody has a good day. I'm sorry that I'm ending a little bit earlier than usual. I uh, hope you understand and um, have a good rest of the week, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.